Right. So I was roaming around, and uh, everybody seemed to be engaged, and uh, just wonderful, wonderful conversations and lots of quotables, so pick those up on the side. Um, Andrew has disappeared from view because he has technology issues, but he assures me he's putting them right. Oh, he's come back again. Here he is. It's like a Punch and Judy show. Um, who would like to go first and just give us a bit of a summing up with key themes? Uh, Andrew. Uh, no, Andrew isn't. There's one in every pack, isn't there? Andrew is not going first. Here we go, Debbie. Thank you. Oh, yes. Because my speed reading capacity is a bit um, limited today. I know I'm short, but um, we were looking at the challenges that our various libraries are facing in terms of providing digital access, but also um, raising users' awareness or informing them about their digital rights and responsibilities. Um, key themes, and this is going to be rapid. Was it, I was getting wrinkles, and that's alarming. Um, was really one of the key themes that came through was the need for schools, public libraries, the National Library, and Uncle Tom Cobley and all to actually be collaborating and cooperating so that we were, we were reinforcing messages, but we were all delivering our own parts, so there were opportunities for working together. Um, we talked a lot about... Uh, people growing in capability and therefore confidence to participate ultimately as a really well-informed citizen. Question that came up probably in each group was the notion of providing support for parents and caregivers. So it was one thing to be providing education in the school or library setting. How are we supporting those students through their home situation? Oh, over Miss Bloggs, please. Thank you. Lord, look, this is sideways writing. <laughs> um, we did have some questions about whether it's a problem at all, whether in fact students can, can discern and find their way through the, the wealth of information that's available and actually that will just happen and that promote, provoked a little bit of fairly lively conversation. Um, and also probably another question that was key for us was whether our social norms are going to change. We at the moment are quite conscious of behaviours that maybe we regard as unacceptable in an online context, whether we are progressively going to become more accepting of some behaviours. So that our social norm, will, will the social norm change? Can't answer, but that's an interesting question to think about. And can we look at the last sheet, please? Uh, oh, plain English usage statements. So how hard is it to nut out whether you're actually able to use that information or those images? That's really important and particularly for the age group of students that I work with. Strong emphasis on the library as a social hub and look at that. Um, the need for whatever learning opportunities we provide to be authentic and just in time. So when students or parents or anyone needs the information, that's the time for us to be providing the support rather than a sort of one-size-fits-all, which very rarely fits anybody particularly well. I'm stopping now. Perfect, Debbie. Yeah, I can pass the microphone to George because he's organised. There you go. Thank you very much. A round of applause for Debbie. Thanks. Um, Thanks, everyone, for being so enthusiastic with ideas, too. I, I think one of the best things about our group was I got uh, some great success stories from people. Um, someone suggested at their library they had a program called Stepping Up, which was a series of um, workshops that they offered to seniors. Um, and and uh, this they followed up with a thing called Seniors Net, which was kind of organised by the seniors themselves, I think, in a, in a small kind of lunchtime workshop way, and they got guest speakers in and things like that. That, that sounded fantastic. Um, we also talked about uh, an approach which was really, um, it, we have literacy in the middle, and literacy is something that's moving and, and changing, I think, as Craig Tomler pointed out this morning, it could be about uploading a video. Um, but on the other side of that, we have fluency where people feel like they can do um, all sorts 
of things, uh, both communicating online and uh, receiving information online. But before you get to literacy, there's, there's tasks. So we had a lot of great examples of tasks that people had from uh, people who were saying they would like to research their family history online, um, to looking at pictures of their grandkids and, and finding out what those things were. Um, someone I think else, I think, said they had great success with um, military history as well. And one of the nice things about their military history panel was that they found not only that um, older people came to it, but older people brought their young person along with them to help them, and they would take turns using the mouse. So there was a really interesting um, idea about mentorship there, you know, that, that younger people could mentor um, older people and help them to participate uh, in, in digital literacy that way. Um, and that, that could be a, a really good intergenerational experience. Um, mentorship, I think, is really important uh, because, you know, we probably all feel like we have limited resources. So what we're doing is teaching people to fish with digital literacy. We want to get them to the point where they're fluent and able to pass those skills on. Um, I, I really want to capture some of the great ideas that came out of the sessions from people. Um, w there were two resources that I said that I would, I would tell you about, godigi.org.au, which has a series of um, self-service resources that you can uh, go and grab for yourself, and also learnmyway.com, uh, which is uh, coming out of the Tinder Foundation as well. But someone else suggested a great resource in um, internet buttons, because one of the things that we had coming through, I think across all three sessions, people were saying, um, older people feel that things are changing on the internet all the time. Google Mail used to have this here and then it's moved and now it's moved. But um, as I understand it, um, and s someone else suggested internet buttons, it's a way of branding things to say, this is your email, this is pictures of your grandchildren, you know, and setting up a desktop for people so that they know where things are. Um, yes, we, we talked about there's a change in learning styles, I think. Um, and it's, it's a much, it's much greater emphasis for older people on lifelong learning and being able to continue to refresh their skills and maybe not being so, uh, not being so intimidated by the change that the web brings, um, that things will move around, things will change and that's okay. Um, also from the GoDigit initiative I talked about um, digital confessions um, where people did one to two minute videos talking about how they've failed to do something online. Um, and I think those kind of finding good exemplars is, is a good thing too. I'm going to get the executive at the National Museum. Every time I tell them this, they laugh and they think it, I'm joking. So <laughs> I hope it remains funny after we start doing it. I'm going to get them to do a digital dare where um, they have to do something that makes them uncomfortable. Um, it might be for people who've never tweeted before to do that or um, to you know, open up a Facebook account or master Periscope or something like that. And I think when those stories come from uh, your executive, you start to feel like it's okay to experiment and to make mistakes and do those things. So, um, yeah, I think that's about all. Thanks, George. And one of those digital confessions uh, that's on the GoDigi website at the moment was, in fact, the former Premier of Tasmania, who was one of the key supporters and architects of the yeah, Adult Literacy Action Plan. So, um, uh, worth a look. Um, we talked in our group, um, we, would, we were focusing on the role of libraries in providing support for literacy skills that underpin digital literacy and digital engagement. Um, and we talked a little bit about the tensions that um, are encountered sometimes in terms of where's the line in delivering education as opposed to providing access to education or information, access to opportunities. Um, we, we basically, you know, the common, all groups agreed that the importance, um, that the value a library could provide was that it was a welcoming space. And in the 2610 context and Link Tasmania context, it's certainly about um, being the place where people who might, might have become disengaged from learning are able to re-engage in a, in a non-confrontational way. And that's been really key. Um, in order to bring people's skills up to a level where they can then engage with more institutional learning, skills and confidence. Um, libraries are a place that can do that. Um, but we also um, recognised around the various groups that the, that the other role that many libraries play is just in providing a space where other providers can, can offer that same experience with the same kind of um, benefits. Um, and we talked a bit about the need for reaching out beyond the walls of libraries, recognising that for some of the people who really need support to improve their skills, libraries are also too threatening and, and um, we need to go beyond that out to community groups, to um, community houses and um, wherever else we can find the people who might be disengaged. Um, 
So that was uh, pretty, pretty general across the three groups. In terms of the, the other part of our discussion, which was about the potential role for libraries in advocating um, broad community engagement in, in this issue, in the need for people to improve their skills and, for, and in the importance of um, supporting digital um, inclusion. We talked about various different um, ways that, um, that libraries did that, um, and, but there was, a, there was a really key um, element about how to engage the government in seeing the importance of this. And um, so uh, I spoke a little bit about the Tasmanian experience, which is that we've, over the life of the Adult Literacy Action Plan, we've, had, we've seen that having ambassadors and people who can actually tell real life stories has been really valuable and important. Sometimes they are people who have taken the step to come forward and improve their skills. Those stories are very personal and can be very meaningful. But we've also got a lot of um, benefit out of having key big business or small business ambassadors who have been able to talk about um, the, the other sorts of benefits, and increased productivity, um, uh, better work and health and safety outcomes, uh, those kinds of things. So. There are, there are so many different benefits from raising people's literacy and numeracy skills and increasing their capacity to be digital citizens that you can package the message up in, in many different ways depending on your audience. And um, being a repository for all of that information, having access to the people whose stories um, can be used in different ways is, is something that uh, libraries and public libraries and um, library networks in general can do. Um, and just finally, um, I'd just say if people are interested in 2610, um, and I handed out some of these, um, our strategy and the action plan, we do have a website, which is um, just if you search for 2610 in Tasmania, you'll find it. And um, we'd be very keen to engage with, with people across, um, across Australia and New Zealand to talk about um, these sorts of things, because it's a pretty much a work in progress. Thanks, Andrew. Nice of you to pop in from the workshop. Um, if you would just uh, wrap up your sessions for us. Thank you. Um, yes, just in time. So what I, what I uh, intended to do with my session was two things. We were going to answer a, a survey uh, using a, um, a platform called Mentimeter.com. And the value of doing something like that explained in a broader context of teaching and learning was that it gives... Um, it's a great provocation tool to give people the chance to think about issues and allow people to make anonymous uh, opinions uh, in, a, in, a, in a more or less controlled environment in that sense. Um, and so when my, the, the groups came to me, I, I, uh, either at the beginning or at the end, I, I asked them, um, I sent them, a, I gave them a link to go to, um, which is at govote.at, and it was, it was really just taking on a scale of one to five or one to ten, how, you st how much you strongly agreed or disagreed with the subject. So Barb, if you can just go to the next slide. Thank you. So it's, it's gonna be very hard to see for you back there, but in a moment I'll give you a link that'll give you access to the whole slide deck that I referred to. So just, just that bit of housekeeping is important there. But how strongly do you agree or disagree with the following statements? Okay, so this was all around uh, conversations that I've had with secondary stu school students and different groups around uh, around the way information is is presented and 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 bundled together by different organizations, whether it's Google, whether it's a country, whether it's a teacher, whether it's a librarian, and so the conversations that came out of this were really around uh, information literacy is a or digital literacy is a subset. It was believed of of, in, of digital literacy was a subset of information literacy, and that uh, that there's prop, there's going to be some inherent bias in the way that uh, as librarians, as, edu as educators, as we interact and we share information, we try to provide a very neutral um, uh, acceptance of different viewpoints, but then there was a discussion around how much uh, the filter bubble effect around our filters, our lenses, and the friends that we have, how much that affects the way we understand information. So if we only get our news feed through Facebook, then we are, um, for young people, they're going to get a certain uh, flavor to the world based on that. Um, 
there was a really interesting point called the power of the prevailing orthodoxy, which I, which I really liked. So it's, um, and I think, a, I think there was a real agreement that no matter what we do, we, and as, as unbiased as we like to be, the values that we have are always going to come through. Um, and so we talked a little bit about the key competencies in the New Zealand curriculum as well. So managing, thinking, relating to others, all those things certainly come through in a school context. And I think the other thing that came out was the, um, the politics around a filter bubble. So sometimes you might be approached by the media yourself and you may have to defer to somebody else in your company or organization because your views might not align necessarily with the way uh, your organization would like to um, sanitize it or present it in some way. So that's important. And we think about that in the context of schools, that we want to give our kids a voice. We want to expose them to different viewpoints. But we also want them to be able to understand what extremism looks like, what um, opinion looks like, what bias looks like. So we talked about the Martin Luther King Jr. Um, hate site that um, appears on the, um, on the Google search feed on page one of the uh, result results. Um, so all those kinds of filter bubbles that exist, the hardware systems and then the soft systems that affect our ability to be digitally literate. Um, and I know there was a, quite a bit more, but that's probably after all my tech. And if we just go to the next slide, thanks Barb. Um, that is the link, that, the quick link that takes you to all the slides. And I, so I encourage you to f please feel free to go in and have a look. Um, there's the World Press Freedom Index. There's some hopefully some interesting things in there that you can have with your clients or your students or people. Um, so we'll just leave that up for a little bit if you want to go and check that out. Um, that would be great. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you, Andrew. <clears throat> well, thanks, everybody. Now, hold on to that. Um, Barbara is now just um, dying to run around the room with a microphone because this furniture configuration is wonderful for a microphone runner. It should be quite amusing for the rest of us. Um, any questions or comments, things that you just want to add in quickly in the last few minutes? Something that really should have been said and you didn't hear it? Hand up. Anybody want to add anything? Gosh, it was all covered. Really? Wow. Oh, you guys could have taken much longer. Whew. Anything from your perspective that you wish you had said and you didn't kind of cover off? So one of my great note takers wrote, enthusiasm is infectious too, which I think is a really nice point to end on too. Um, if you've got good people who are excited about what they're doing and can tell their stories about doing things online, I think that's more useful than, you know, putting on a lot of workshops and training sessions. Sure. Thank you, George. Debbie? No? Okay. Oh, no, look, Anita's dying. Here comes the le bon mot. We did have a little discussion about how to secure funding, um, which is probably worth noting because I think um, we, earlier in the day, we were talking about sort of pooling resources and working together and all those sorts of things. And one of the benefits of a small state like Tasmania is that that's probably more achievable than elsewhere, but um, possibly, you know, looking at New Zealand where you've got at least one, le one less level of government than we have in Australia, there are advantages there too. So I think really um, the key to getting the, the funding that's needed for all of this has to be working together and, and, um, and working out how we can make the most of the resources that do exist. Um, and that's certainly something that came through all of our groups. Do you want to add something? I'll just, I'll just add, the, one of the issues that also came up, and, it, and I'm not sure if it arose for everybody else, but just the issue of time, and, that, and, that be, uh, and it was mentioned that as I work in, in teaching and learning schools, predominantly I've, there's a lot more opportunity to, have, to, to form relationships with some of the students and to have a little bit more time with them to, to talk about and to work through digital literacy and information literacy, and, and, and that because we are... I think when we live in a very accelerated world that we're in, where we're constantly snacking on different, on stimuli coming through, we sometimes we don't, we move on to something else very quickly, but we also don't look back. We don't look in the rear view mirror nearly enough. And, and a lot of schools fall down with, with e-learning and bring your own device and all that stuff because there's not the, the professional learning that's built into it. So I guess, I guess the, the time issue for libraries, I imagine people, that you have a very different relationship with your clients maybe, or in some ways than, than teachers do in a sense, and so how you, how you make the most of that time with them when they're used to a world that's, 
that's accelerated and hyperlinked to a million things. Sure. So thanks, Andrew. Yeah. Uh, colleagues, this has been a really rich session. Oh, oh sorry. Oh. Sorry, just, just that oh. training thought raised a really um, interesting point that I heard recently. Someone sort of said um, it's very hard to make a, a case internally to train your people around digital skills. Um, so this was a joke when someone else told it. I'll probably make a mess of it. Um, but So the CFO says, what if we train these people up in digital skills and they leave? And then the CEO says, what if we don't and they stay? <laughs> and I think that's kind of the thing is like, you know, we, we want to be improving our staff so they stay and they're valuable to us. Thank you, George. <laughs> it's worth ending on a gag. Um, I just want to uh, uh, again congratulate everybody on the vigour that was brought to the discussions and I hope that everybody feels that um, you know we've gone away with something valuable. I guess as a segue into the session after the afternoon tea, one of the questions is whose voices have been absent from the discussion this afternoon? Whose voices have not been represented in the way that we might think they could be represented? And that feels to me a really strong segue into uh, the last session of the day. That is not to negate anything that took part in the last session, all really rich stuff, but they go naturally together. I, of course, was walking around the room, being a uh, the two rooms, being a very responsible timekeeper, which just about kills me. I'm an ENFP, and I'm not really built for timekeeping. Um, and I found this big bowl of these little um, uh, boxes, which have got beautiful um, colouring pencils in them, which are no doubt ideal for mindfulness. They have NL50 on them. They are not mine to give away. I just found them in one of the rooms. But I think these thought leaders and facilitators have been so fantastic <laughs> that surely, surely, Bill is going to be able to do whatever hokery pokery needs to be done in the column somewhere for me just to steal these pencils and to give them away as a mark of respect for our leaders this afternoon. <laughs>